Dinosaurs, okay, well, uh, it was actually uh, Mark Gable and I, we, we kind of, I hadn't really met Mark before, uh, and then we did the 2006 uh, Countdown tour, you know, Hush played there, Choir Boys, and we kind of got along, you know, we sort of, we had a good time together and, and uh, did some stuff and and we started hanging out and I said, well, why don't we kind of put together a band playing the sort of music that we wanted to play back in the early 70s when we were forming bands. And in a funny way, I mean, Hush was never exactly the band that I wanted to be in, but, you know, it was successful, but um, I really wanted to play big riffs um, and, you know, be a little bluesier. Uh, but, you know, of course that wasn't ever going to pay the bills. Um, and uh, anyway, we just thought, look, why don't we sit down and just start writing, you know, not trying to write anything modern, just write stuff that we think is kind of cool, back, you know, which inspired us, you know, shuffle feels and, you know, things that are otherwise considered daggy. And so we just said, yeah, great. So who, so who will we get to play drums? Oh, you know, what about Buzz? Yeah, great. Let's get Buzz and, and Marky Evans. And that'd make, make a lot of sense. So, and we all kind of sat around and talked about it and said, yeah, yeah, no, we're interested. And, and then we started rehearsing. We were like just mucking around to sort of say, nobody brings any songs. Just start jamming, you know, okay. Just start a groove. And we started playing. We thought, you know what? There's something in this, you know. And we couldn't think of a more appropriate name than the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, just let's get to the point, you know. And the thing about dinosaurs is that, you know, they, they were much maligned because, you know, if it wasn't for a bloody big comet, they'd still be here, you know, so, yeah. 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 There is so much experience in that band. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's called age, but look, experience, it's called experience. No, it's, it's great. And also we all came from the same... The, I'm actually slightly the outsider because um, ACDC, uh, Choir Boys and, and the Angels all were signed to Alberts at some stage and Hush was you know, the only band that wasn't. Who were you signed with? We were signed with Wizard, with Robbie Porter. Now, mm. a lot of uh, uh, younger viewers mm. would not have known of Hush. Well, uh, tell them about Hush. Considering Hush, you know, um, uh, split up in 1977, it's probably you'd have to be old anyway to, to kind of know. Hush was uh, formed in 1970, well, probably before, probably around 1972. I joined them in 1973, I think. Um, and it uh, came from uh, a guy called Keith Lamb, who was a singer. He came from a little country town in, in the UK called Norwich. And from the time he was 13, he and his little, ba he had a little band there, uh, were the only band in Norwich. And so whenever touring bands came through Norwich, they got to be the support act. And so they supported uh, in those days, and this is the late 60s or whatever, uh, like, you know, The Who and uh, Cream and, um, you know, uh, uh, fun, you know, bands like Gino Washington and the Ram Jam Band, you know, like all these kind of different acts. And he got to s sit on the side of the stage and see all these incredible performers come through. 
uh, and see exactly what they did behind the scenes. And so he kind of gathered all this information. And by the time he came out to Australia, when he was like 18, 19 years old, you know, it was a 10 pound pom, he wanted to form a band, but he knew exactly what, what was, you know, he wanted. He wanted, you know, now it's about putting on a show. Uh, it's about kind of getting all glam and doing all that, you know, stuff that was still way behind, beyond what everyone else was doing in Australia, because everyone was still in kind of jeans and, you know, and playing 20 minute guitar solos and stuff, which by the way, I liked, but nevertheless. Um, and uh, I joined the band uh, later on when they were looking for a guitar player. And I was in the Battle of the Bands with some schoolmates. It was the, you know, uh, we did the Cabramatta Battle of the Bands. And on our, in our heat was Sherbet. <laughs> so they kind of ended up winning it. But, you know, we still did okay because uh, we played um, a Rory Gallagher song and a 10 Years After song. So the, all the uh, surfers and stuff were right into us. Uh, anyway, um, the, the other guys from Hush said, you would be great for our band because I, I was, I've always been kind of pretty outrageous on stage and, you know, do all that. And so they thought that would kind of stiffen up the lineup. Uh, they were playing like weddings and, you know, bar mitzvahs and that type of thing. So um, I joined them because our band was maybe got one gig a year and these guys were playing like one gig a week. So I thought, well, that's a big step up. Um, and that's how it started. And a couple of months down the, the line, some somebody in the band said, you know what? Um, we, we're supposed to write our own material and since I was the only guy who played any uh, an instrument that you know had some sort of harmonic structure to it you know which is the guitar um, they said well why don't you write the songs and the other you know uh, Keith will kind of fix the truck and Smiley will um, you know make the kind of clothes and stuff you know I thought yeah that's all sounds pretty fair so that's what we did and I started writing some songs and the first thing we wrote was a um, uh, a song called Get the Feeling, you know, but it became, um, it got recorded, which was a, a shock, and then it became like top 10 in Sydney and top 10 in Perth, and that got us under, underway. Right up until 77. Okay, 77. Yeah, yeah, whole five years. Right. After that, you went into the studio and did a diff took a whole different uh, tact on things. Yeah. Um, towards the end of... Uh, by 77, um, you know, it was all starting to, to go... You know, we were still you know, selling gold albums and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, I don't want to hang in there if if we've gone past a certain point and uh, and I just happened to notice that when we were in Melbourne I saw um, one of the guys from a band called the bootleg band and he was like a keyboard player and he drove in in a, a silver Alfa Romeo I said man you know we, we've had like you know so many number one records and and sell out tours right around the country and we can't afford anything you know like how come how, how's he doing so well they said, oh, he writes jingles. I said, oh, right, right, what are jingles? You know, I said, well, that's music for ads. So I thought, uh, you know, that's what I want to do. So I, um, I just sort of stumbled into the business. I happened to be right time, right place. Um, a lot of the, there weren't many people doing it, didn't know about the business. And, and I just sort of started off my own little thing and just happened to fall on my feet and, and build up the business from there. And, you know, 27 years later, I... I uh, built it up so it was, you know, we had studios in Singapore and Melbourne and all over the place and and, uh, and then I sold it after 27 years. 
Mm. What were some of the memorable jingles that you did? Um, well, a lot of them were like, for instance, uh, most people know the, uh, you know, the the Qantas ad with the kids doing "Still Call Australia Home," you know. Uh, then the, you know, before that, things like Decore with D D Dirty Corre, the old um, Duke of Earl song. Um, you know, this goes without it, Suzanne, which goes even further back than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of ones that are still on air. You know, uh, Oh What a Feeling, Toyota. You, know, you, this you goes, did that. You wrote yeah, that. Yeah, it, it goes back through in 1980. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. yeah. Was it easy for you to come up with a little? I mean, it would seem like it would take well quite a bit of thinking to. Yeah, I mean, you, I sort of uh, got into it because I um, uh, um, ha have a, a, a sort of a second, a, a sixth sense for um, taking a brief. I mean, basically, what you are is an, an architect. Uh, someone has you know something that they need music design for and um, and it doesn't have to be music that you particularly like Careful. or whatever you know it, it's just to sort of go great I understand what your your product is I understand who it's talking to um, and I think you know this is how music can link those two things your product and these people and that's basically what music does I mean it doesn't whatever your personal tastes are it what music does is link you with either somebody else or some other product or and 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 a lot of these brands um, think of themselves as 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 personalities you know a brand has a coca-cola has a personality McDonald's has a personality so all, all that music does is try and link you with those other people mm -hmm. you actually were approached by the ABC to put a book together yeah, um, I, I did a uh, uh, I did a book uh, called uh, uh, So You Want to Be a Rock Star. Yeah. Uh, initially, they wanted me to I don't know why, but they wanted me to write a book about you know, my history, and I thought oh, I don't think anyone's going to be interested in that. Um, but what I would be interested in is you know I um, I and and most people who are in the industry get um, approached by parents or kids or whatever to say, oh, you know, how do I break into the music business? You know, like, uh, what, do, what do I do? You know, I've written some songs or I, I play a bit of guitar or I sing. Uh, what do I do now? So uh, I said, that's what, what people are interested in. You know, they're interested in, well, how do I get into this industry? And so I thought, rather than just my opinion, uh, I'll go and interview everyone I know uh, from all different walks of the music industry and say, well, you know, what, uh, how do you become a star? How do you become a, you know, how do you form a band? How do you put it together? So I, I spoke to heads of record companies, heads of publishing companies, um, you know, radio people, and also uh, stars themselves, you know, from Missy Higgins to, you know, Paul Mack and all, the, all different people. And just sort of said, okay, tell us your story. And put, put all that together so that rather than dictate, okay, this is how you break into the industry. Um, this is more from the point of view of these are the people who are working in the industry now. And if you wanted to be a great songwriter, um, this is how they would recommend you get started or how the whole business works. And uh, I think it's it's an interesting book. It's, it's uh, in fact, a part of the education uh, syllabus uh, at the moment. and. Uh, um, and it's one of those things, if you, if you read it, you sort of firstly realise there is no one way of doing it. Uh, and secondly, um, that having talent is just, just buys you a ticket in the game. You know, really after that, to be successful relies on a whole lot of other things, including persistence and, and a certain kind of, I hate to use the word, it's, the word, it's so um, cliche, but X factor. But certainly you have to have talent to start mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Who are your, your favourite guitar players, Les? Um, now, they're all old school guys who, yeah, because these are the guys who I idolised when I was a kid. Um, and they would range from Johnny Winter, um, Rory Gallagher mm -hmm. I mentioned, obviously, you know, your, your Clapton's and your... Um, um, you know uh, all those guys, but um, and, and Jeff Beck, but on 
truth. Um, and uh, and Pete Townsend for, you know, really kind of his inventiveness. You know, obviously from my era, because it happened to be when I grew up, you know, Hendrix kind of looms large over all of that. Um, and uh, it's really hard to, you know, you have to sort of imagine going back to that time, listening to Hendrix for the first time and going, man, where did this guy get this stuff from? Yeah. Where are these ideas coming from? I mean, now, we're, you know, we're kind of used to hearing the Hendrix thing and it has a certain sort of resonance, but back then it just came out of absolutely nowhere. Uh, so he, he obviously traverses the whole lot. But um, uh, my all-time favourite guitar solo is still the recorded version of Red House. Right. Um, it still it just has so much soul to it. Um, and I, I, I don't know how many times I've listened to that and just over and over and over again. Love it. But um, Richie Blackmore, all, all, the, all the kind of classic guys of the time for all different reasons. Yeah. You know, it, the couple of times I've played with you, mm. as soon as you come up on stage, there's electricity. Mm. Did you know that? Well, it, it, it's there for me yeah. because uh, walking on stage feels very, very natural to me. And um, I, I just, you know, um, I feel absolutely at home on stage. And even when we were uh, starting out, uh, with Hush, it happened to be a time when there were, were a lot of big concerts. When I say big concerts, 20,000 people, 30,000 people. I think a lot of radio stations were putting on these things. And that just suited me absolutely to the ground. It was just all felt natural. So, you know, like when I walk on stage, it just feels right. So maybe that, that you know, it's a reciprocal thing that happened. Was it something that you worked on? No, it's, it was just right from the you know, the, the day when I walked on stage, at, you know, for um, uh, the Battle of the Bands, that was the first time I was in front of a, a crowd. I, had, I just thought, yep, this is where I should be, and I had no, yeah, just no fear, no anything. I just thought, yeah, this is great, I love it, you know, so. Where do you see the dinosaurs going? Um, yeah, that's a funny question because, uh, you know, it, it's not like it's not like we all you know we think oh you know we'll be the, you know, the biggest band on earth but I think what we want to find is that firstly we want to find our little voice and the voice we know it's there it's it's got it's going to be absolutely raw um, no frills no thing it's just uh, a bunch of guys getting up there and playing as we used to and then hopefully there's an audience there and I don't know who that audience that they actually could be kids mm -hmm. um, you know presumably there's a you know people who know our history will probably be into it I'm not sure because we're, we're going to we're writing new stuff you know um, uh, we don't really know we don't it, it's not that it's not we don't care in the sense that we don't you know want to do well it's it's that uh, we're just going to do it because it's fun mm -hmm.